So fun fact, I actually already recorded this video, but I, I didn't have the camera on. I just had the microphone on and not the camera. So, oh, here we go. Take two. Clap. <laughs> so the whole point of this video was to uh, explore the fact that quite often a lot of people say, oh, I'm a beginner. What's the best tool that I should start out with? And people always say airbrush. How do I get smooth paint? Airbrush. How do I do this? Just get an airbrush. And I don't think that's always the best advice because let's face it, they can be prohibitively expensive and also they have a massively steep learning curve. So in this video, join me as I build this. The F80C shooting star in 170 second scale using just some simple old rattle cans and some hand painting techniques. I'm Matt, this is Model Minutes, and let's get this down onto the workbench. Cool transition. I've already done an unboxing video on this particular kit, so if you'd like to take a look at the contents and see deeper dive what you get included in the box, take a look at that specific video. For this video, I'll be focusing on how I built it and my thoughts on this kit, rounding it up in a review. I'll pop a list of the products I used during this build on the screen now to give you an idea of the kind of things you might want to go and get if you fancy having a go for this one for yourself. As is usual for my builds at the moment, I'll start by snipping the parts I need from the sprue using my cutters and then sanding smooth any flash or rough areas of plastic with a sanding stick. Humbrol Liquid Poly will be my glue of choice during this build. It comes with a little brush inside the lid. It's not the tidiest brush in the world, but it does do the job. The first parts to be constructed are the cockpit details. This kit, despite its age, does come with a few details. This includes the cockpit tub, a chair, a control panel, and also a control stick. This part was then glued into position on the fuselage wall of one half of the fuselage. I then opted to paint these areas, now that they're in place, with Humbrol number 80 grass green. This is actually an enamel paint and I used it straight out of the pot and I only ended up using one thin coat. It does have an increased drying time over acrylics though. So whilst this was drying, I moved on to the pilot figure. First up, Humbrol 61 matte flesh acrylic was used on his face. I then used a Vallejo Model Air US Air Force Olive Drab on his flight suit. This is an airbrush ready paint, but I'm brushing it on here. It is a little bit thinner, but it acts a bit like a contrast paint and lets those details on the pilot suit come through. It adds contrast and shade already, so that's pretty cool. Humbrol 24 Trainer Yellow was used on his flying helmet. Vallejo English Uniform was used on his straps and on his gloves. Not forgetting his boots, of course. Humbrol 33 Matte Black was used on his face mask and oxygen tube, as well as the visor on his helmet. Whilst I've got this black paint out, I'll also paint some parts of the cockpit, including the headrest, the control panel and the control stick. And now the pilot is ready to glue into place. Some paint was removed from his seat and some glue applied to those areas and he was dropped into place, ready to fly the plane. I then glued the fuselage halves together. I run the cement along the seams and then held the parts together until they cured. Just remember that if you're building this one with me to install your nose weight before you do this step. I'm actually going to have mine in a flying pose because I like to have my kits flying and I don't need any nose weight. However, if yours is wheels down, pop some weight in the nose. I think it's five grams is what Airfix recommends, just so yours doesn't sit on its tail when you've finished it. With the fuselage halves joined together, I then use my sanding stick to clean up the seams. If you want to install the underwing tanks and pylons for the bombs, there are some holes that need to be drilled out. Some little locating points are molded into the plastic to make this more obvious where they are. I did this using a small drill bit and then glued the upper wing halves into place, holding them in position until the glue had cured. The wings could then be glued into place 
on the fuselage. There is a tiny little gap at the wing root, but if you're careful and you hold the wings in the right position as, it, as the glue cures, you can try and minimize this. The engine exhaust pipe was then glued into position at the back of the aircraft, and then moving to the front of the aircraft, I installed the engine air intakes. There is a little plate which needs to be glued to the fuselage wall and then the cowling which goes around it. I did have to clean up the cowling a little bit to get it to fit nice and snug. This does need to be repeated on both sides of the nose. The horizontal tail surfaces can then be glued into their slots on the tail. Interestingly, the aircraft does come with the option to have its air brake in an open or closed position. I decided to have mine in the closed position. I then glued into place the main landing gear bay doors in the raised position. There is some nice internal detail in the landing gear bays, which is interesting to see from a model kit of this vintage. So if you have got your wheels down, there is something in there to look at. And it was at this point I realized I made a massive mistake. So we already know that I'm having mine in its flying pose, but where am I going to put the display stand? Well, it needs to go on the bottom of the aircraft. That's what Airfix designed into the particular kits they had at the time. And I've completely forgotten to do that. So I very carefully disassembled the wings and the fuselage at this point. In the bottom of the lower wing, there is a little molded slot and all you need to do is cut that out. This is quite typical of the design of this period for display stands. More recent Airfix kits don't have this particular design choice. Having cut out the slot and tidied it up, I then carefully reassembled my model kit. And after I'd done that, I glued into place the landing gear covers which go on the nose of the aircraft. There is a small hole just forward of this nose wheel landing gear bay and I glued in the pitot tube here. You do get a choice of drop tanks in this kit. You get some smaller ones and some uh, extended or longer ones. I went for the smaller ones and they come in two parts. They simply get glued together. The bombs also come in two parts and again they were glued together as well. The wingtip fuel tanks were then glued into place using those pre-drilled holes from earlier. I'm going to leave the bombs off for now though because they need painting separately. The canopy was masked in my normal way just applying tape to the relevant areas and then using the canopy frames as a guide for my knife to trim the tape to the right shape. Humbrol Clear Fix was then used to glue the canopy onto the model. This glue should dry clear and strong without reacting with the plastic and fogging it up, which other glues can do. You do have to be careful with the application though as it is a bit stringy. There were a few little gaps in a few places on this kit that I decided to fix, particularly around the air intake nozzles on the front of the aircraft. Some Humbrol model filler was added to these areas, smoothed down and then sanded. And now it's time to prime. So to prime this aircraft, I'm actually using a generic black gloss spray paint. This is just something cheap, which I picked up in a home hardware shop. I applied this in thin light coats working in a side to side motion, but it should form a good base layer for the silver I'm about to use. So when that was dry, Humbrol 11 silver was again sprayed onto the aircraft in the same manner. You can get different spray cans with different metallic effects, but I think this is a relatively simple way to get a vibrant silver colour using that black gloss primer and then the silver on top. Spraying from the correct distance should ensure I get a nice smooth finish. When that was done, I masked off the anti-glare panel on the nose of the aircraft using some strips of tape and Russian uniform from Vallejo, which is a kind of close match for the color asked for in the instructions, was then carefully painted onto this area. A few thin coats would be needed. 
I'd also use a couple of coats of this colour on the bonds. Umbral number 25, which is the matte blue colour requested by the instructions, was then applied to the nose of the aircraft. I have decided that I'm going to use the blue stripe decals which are included, so have masked off the correct area and hopefully those decals should overlap a little bit. I'm also hoping that this colour, as requested by the instructions, will match the colour on the decals. Some more of the matte black number 33 from Humbrol was then used to carefully paint the panel on the nose of the aircraft and then this was outlined using some Vallejo aluminium. This was just done freehand with a fine brush but you could mask it for a neater edge if you wanted to. Vallejo gunmetal grey was then carefully used to paint the gun barrels on the nose of the aircraft as well as the engine exhaust at the rear. There is a small panel at the tip of the rudder which needs to be grey, so some Humbrol 64 was used for that. This is a light grey colour. Again, a couple of thin coats would be needed. And now it's time to move on to the decals. So inside the box you get a reasonable size sheet of cartograph decals. The printing of these is exceptional, with even the small bits of text legible. And you do have the option of using the included stripes or simply painting your own ones and applying the extra decal of the dragon over the top if you wish, which is a nice inclusion for that particular choice from Airfix. I cut the sheet into more manageable sections and then dipped them in warm water, allowing the transfers to release from the backing paper. As usual, I'm going to be using Micro Set and Sol as my setting solutions during this build. First up, the stuff from the blue bottle was applied to the model in the correct locations for the transfer I was applying. The transfer was then slid off the backing paper and into place. Some repeated applications of the setting solution might be needed just to help settle them down into the details. I didn't have any issues with the application of the transfers and I didn't get any silvering either, which is thanks due to that very smooth, shiny silver surface. A little bit of extra care did have to be taken though with the particularly long stripe which goes on either side of the nose. When the transfers were in place, I applied some of the micro sole from the red bottle over the surface of the transfers to further soften them down onto the plastic. Whilst the transfers were curing, I then glued on the bombs to their pylons. And once everything was ready, I clear coated the entire model using a clear gloss lacquer. Again, this was another spray can product. This will help protect and seal in those transfers and previous paint layers, allowing me to handle the model without running the risk of chipping the paint away or ruining those transfers. If I wanted to do some weathering as well, it would also protect them from that step, but I am going to leave this in a pristine condition because I quite like the way it looks. I then glued the bombs and pylons into place on the lower side of the wings. I'm glad I forward planned for this because there are transfers in the way and those transfers would have been much harder to apply had the pylons been in position. The final step was to carefully remove all of the masking tape on the canopy of the aircraft. And with that, I called my build of the F-80C shooting star in 172nd scale from Airfix complete. So, what do you think of my build? Let me know down in the comments. I did stick this aircraft on a Airfix display stand, which does come separately. You have to purchase that as a separate item. Unfortunately, they don't seem to come inside the boxes these days. But I do like having this on my shelf in its flying pose. Personally, I had quite a bit of fun building this one, and it was nice just to spray up the model and do some freehand painting, almost in a back to basics kind of build. So let's talk a bit about this kit. I'm sure that it's no surprise that a vintage classic kit is not one of the most recent toolings from the Airfix range. The tooling for this particular kit dating from 1973. And despite that, the mold quality was actually quite good. There was a little bit of flash in a few places. And I did have to fix a few little areas that needed some filling but I was pleasantly surprised by the level of detail in the cockpit area and the landing gear bays. If you go for the landing gear lowered option, there is a little bit of detail in there to see. 
Externally though, there isn't that much detail. As can be expected for an aircraft of this vintage, the panel lines are of the raised variety. However, they're very subtle and there aren't that many. I have no doubt in my mind that I'm sure the original F-80 would have had smoothened panel lines, perhaps puttied or sanded down in some way, to allow the aircraft to fly faster and make it more aerodynamic. But nonetheless, the details externally on this aircraft are very subtle, so they don't really stand out. Perhaps that's an area where a modeler could improve the look of their aircraft if they wanted to. One small thing I do want to mention as well is that the Humbrol 25 on the nose of the aircraft isn't quite a perfect match for the decal colour. If you look carefully you'll be able to notice the transition between the two. This was considerably more noticeable when the Humbrol 25 was in its matte finish, being much lighter. But having had a gloss layer applied to it, it does bring it in line a little bit more, but it is ever so slightly not quite the same colour. So if you wanted to avoid this, painting the stripes yourself and then applying the separate transfers over the top might be a better choice. If you fancied getting one of these for yourself though, how much could you be looking at paying? Well, on the Airfix website, this is currently retailing for £10.99 at the time I'm making this video. Some modelers might think that's a little bit expensive for an older tooling, but it is in line with some of the cheaper kits in the Airfix range. While some modelers might not be too excited to hand over that amount of money, particularly for a vintage tooling, I think it's worth remembering that this does have the option of two different paint schemes and it comes with cartograph transfers, which are incredibly high quality, and sometimes the transfers do cost just as much as the plastic parts inside the kit. Naturally though, you may be able to find this from other sellers for a lower price. And that's something I may consider doing in the future. I had quite a nice time building this one, and I could be interested in building this again, perhaps in the other paint scheme, or maybe you could find some alternative decal schemes online for some different versions. I think though it's probably time to wrap this one up. This is a kit which I had quite a bit of fun with. It does show its age in some respects, but on the whole it's not too difficult to complete and with some simple techniques and products you can get a reasonable result with it. I hope for those of you who don't want to use an airbrush or perhaps don't have one, this has given you some inspiration. And the reason why I can get products like this and mess around with them with uh, different paints and techniques is thanks to my Model Club members. Massive thanks to these guys on screen. If you'd like to find out more about what becoming a Model Club member means, take a look at the links in the description. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome the latest members to the club. They are Solaris, Model Bar 403 and John Potts. Welcome to the club. Alternatively, there are other ways to help support the channel if you'd like to do so, and full information is again underneath the video. Finally, the best way to help support this channel for free is by subscribing with notifications turned on so you never miss a modeling upload. So make sure you stay tuned and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. And finally, the last thing to say is thanks to you for watching this and I'll see you on the workbench again next time. So, in this video, join me as I build this.